Hi, this is Grover Norquist. I run Americans for Tax Reform and I run Leave Us Alone. Uh, the uh, live stream here, Leave Us Alone, is both a video and an audio podcast. If you like what you see and hear, be sure and like and follow us on Facebook and subscribe to Americans for Tax Reform on YouTube. Hitting the thumbs up button would also be appreciated. Your engagement with the show helps more people learn about it. Um, if you're more into uh, audio podcasts, you can do Leave Us Alone with Grover Norquist on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher, or wherever you get your uh, podcasts. Be sure to like and, and leave a review. Um, I'm going to be interviewing, chatting with uh, uh, Dr. John Lott, Jr. He's an economist. Uh, he runs uh, the Crime Prevention Research Center, and he's a well-recognized expert both on guns and crime and, and quite the statistician. Comes up, that gets some good numbers for people to explain what's uh, going on. Uh, he's, uh, all sorts of academic background, including importantly, the University of Chicago, Yale University, Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, Rice University, all sorts of uh, very serious places where he's been uh, working. John Lott, uh, first of all, I love the beard. Uh, and second, uh, could you walk through with us the state of play of the Second Amendment? Um, for those of you who are new, that's the one dealing with guns. Uh, but you wrote a book, More Guns, Less Crime, where at the very beginning of the movement of the 50 states to allow concealed carry permits for people to carry a gun concealed um, and then shall issue concealed carry, which is, hi, I'm 21, I'm not crazy, you have to give me a permit, I don't have to give you a reason, like I carry a lot of cash uh, or my mother doesn't like me. Uh, but you know, you, just because you're 21 and sane and not a criminal, you have the right Second Amendment right to carry a gun concealed. You looked at that and said, this shows the more people carry the less violent crime. Could you walk us through that? Because that's counterintuitive to some. Well, look, uh, thanks. It's great, great to talk to you, Grover. And just as you can make it riskier for criminals to commit crime with higher arrest rates or higher conviction rates or longer prison sentences, the fact that victims might be able to go and defend themselves also makes it riskier for criminals to commit crime. And criminals are really no different than anybody else. If you make something more difficult, more costly for them to do, they're going to do less of it. Um, and we're kind of near what may be the end of the road with regard to concealed carry. Uh, we have 43 states, which are so-called right to carry or constitutional carry states. Texas uh, is just becoming the 21st uh, constitutional carry state where basically once you're a certain age, either 18 or 21, depending upon the state, and you're a law-abiding citizen who's able to legally own a gun, then you're able to go and carry without having to go and get a permit in that state. Mm -hmm. um, and the big change that that creates is that, you know, you've accurately described kind of the May issue where you have to go and demonstrate some type of need. You have to get approval from some public official to be able to carry. Uh, and then you have the right to carry states where uh, once you make a certain age, you pass a criminal background check, you pay your fees, you undergo some type of training that may be required. Then you, if you apply, you're automatically granted. Um, the Supreme Court is gonna be looking at these may issue uh, type rules where uh, you have to give good reason to be able to carry. And if you look at states like California or New York, or New Jersey, you're literally talking about just a couple or a few tenths of 1% of the adult population that's been granted the ability to go and defend themselves. And some place like Los Angeles County, uh, the last I looked, uh, a couple of years ago, there were like 216 uh, concealed handgun permits in a county with 8.5 million adults that were there. Uh, the rest of the country, you're talking about about 10 percent of the adult population has a concealed handgun permit. And that's despite the fact that you have all these constitutional carry states where it's no longer necessary to get a permit. The big thing with constitutional carry the two big changes that it has is it allows people to quickly get uh, a gun for self-defense to be able to go and carry. You may have a woman who's being stalked or threatened. You know, in a state like Texas, it's been at least 60 days for you to be able to go and get a permit. 
you know, Louisiana, which is uh, maybe adopting it soon, it takes like 90 days to go through the process uh, once you even have the training uh, to be able to go and get a permit. 60 days or 90 days might be too long for a woman who's being stalked or threatened. The other big impact that it has is just on the cost. Um, look at Louisiana right now. Uh, it costs about $300 to go through the process to go and get a concealed handgun permit. That may not stop you or I from being able to get a permit, but the very people that my research indicates who benefit the most from having guns are the people who are most likely victims of violent crime. And that overwhelmingly tends to be poor people, particularly poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. Uh, I'll just give you a simple comparison. You look at Illinois and Indiana, two neighboring states. Indiana is obviously heavily Republican, Illinois is heavily Democrat. But in Illinois, over 20% of the adult population has a concealed handgun permit. In Illinois, it's about 3%. Why the- in Indiana's 20? 20%, 20 right. Indiana uh, 20, Illinois three. Right, exactly. You know, why the huge difference in these two neighboring states? And it's pretty simple. In, in Illinois, it costs $12.95 to get a, a five-year permit. In Illinois, the total cost of getting a permit is like $450. You make it a lot more costly, fewer people are going to do it. But that's not the only impact. It also changes the mix of people who go and get concealed handgun permits. In Illinois, it's overwhelmingly wealthy whites who live in the suburbs, which is fine. I'm glad that they're protected, but they're not the ones who are the most likely victims of violent crime. In Illinois and in Indiana, you're much have more permits given out to people who live in zip codes that are heavily black urban areas that are relatively poor. And so in Indiana, you're gonna see a much bigger drop in violent crime than Illinois, simply because one, you have a lot more people that carry, so the risk of a criminal running into somebody who's able to defend themselves is higher. But it also, it's the type of people who are carrying is even more important. The type of people who carry in Indiana are the types of people who are more likely to have been victims of violent crime. Uh, and that makes it ri particularly risky for criminals to go and commit crime. So, Anyway, the Supreme Court is going to be deciding this year, uh, or going to be hearing the case in October, uh, whether or not you can have these very restrictive May issue rules where somebody has to go and explain why they need to get a permit. And then you have some official, I'll just make one other comment, and that is Democrats claim that they care about women and minorities. But when you look to see who they give permits out to. Those aren't the people they give permits to. As I mentioned in Los Angeles County, I was able to get a list of everybody who got a concealed handgun permit. Nationwide, about 30% of permit holders are women. In Los Angeles County, it's 7%. Nationwide, you have about 14% of permit holders are black. In Los Angeles County, it's 5%. 54% of Los Angeles County is Hispanic but only 6% of the permit holders are Hispanic. Is it just that women and blacks and Hispanics don't have crimes committed against them in Los Angeles County, that there aren't women who are being stalked or threatened in Los Angeles County compared to the rest of the country? No, it's just that the Democrats who are in charge of deciding who has a good reason, who has provided a good reason to be able to go and carry, have decided that the women who are applying just aren't providing what they deem to be sufficiently good reasons. The type of people that they end up giving permits to are very wealthy, very politically connected uh, white males. I grew up in Massachusetts and there it was done by town or city. So the police chief in Boston decided if you got a permit, very few permits given out. Uh, police chief in my hometown of 12,000 people was a guy I went to school with and I asked, you know, how do you decide? And he said, I hand them out to anybody who wants one. Uh, so some towns, cities in Massachusetts, you have shall issue and in others, very restrictive. I, I don't know whether that would bother the Supreme Court or not. Well, I mean, there's equal protection type issues. We've seen that being brought up in other cases uh, for different people within a state being treated very differently. Uh, 
but you you know you mentioned Massachusetts. Boston is known for not even giving retired police officers permits to be able to go and carry, which just seems bizarre to me. I mean, here are people that may have spent you know a decade or decades undergoing you know training, actually been on the job carrying a gun, but somehow the minute that they retire, uh, we no longer trust them to be able to go and carry a gun. Here they'd be for free going out and protecting people uh, that may be victims of crime. Uh, how many Americans have a concealed carry permit and how many are believed to carry because, of con because they have constitutional carry, the right to carry regardless? Right, well, uh, we have over 20 million Americans that have a concealed handgun permit. Uh, but as we were talking about earlier now, we have, we're gonna be having 21 states which are constitutional carry, so we don't know for sure how many people are carrying there. There was a poll that was done a few years ago uh, by Pew, uh, I wish we could get that updated, that basically if you looked at the questions, people who said that they carried all the time or carried most of the time made up about 6% of the adult population in the United States. My guess is that's increased uh, I, I think it's probably about four years ago since they did that survey. My guess is that it's increased significantly. One of the and they're what, 600,000 policemen in the country? Uh, yeah, full-time uh, active law enforcement. There's over 600,000. So when you're talking about a, a population of 330 million people, and obviously not all those police officers are on duty at any particular time. You may have like 250,000, maybe in extreme cases, 300,000. To have 300,000 police officers try to protect 330 million people. Look, police, anybody who's read my academic work knows that I think police are extremely important in reducing crime. I think they're probably the single most important factor for reducing crime. The police themselves understand that they virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crimes occurred. And that raises the question, what should people do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves? And if you look at surveys of police officers, police officers are probably the strongest supporters of private ownership of guns of any group that I can find in the United States. Uh, police One, which is by far the largest private organization of police with about 450,000 members, 380,000 are, are active full-time law enforcement, the other 70,000 are retired. 76% um, of their members believe that private ownership of guns is either extremely important or very important in reducing crime. Uh, over 90% of them uh, support uh, concealed handguns. Uh, for people because they know how important having a gun is to protect people. John, at, at Leave Us Alone, this podcast, we look at increasing liberty, how more people in more states can be free to do more things, uh, everything from running their own business to being independent contractors to homeschooling uh, to ha owning their own resources, you know, keeping more of their paychecks. Uh, on the Second Amendment, when and how did concealed carry start to be legalized? What what decade did this begin and how quickly did it grow? Uh, well, it started off pretty slowly. The first state to adopt a, a right to carry law was uh, Indiana in, in the 1920s, I think 1927. I mean, first of all, you have to realize most states had, or really almost no states had regulations until after the Civil War. You started seeing states uh, adopting uh, concealed carry bans uh, in the 1870s. Uh, and largely it was a reaction to blacks carrying guns. Uh, they wanted to make it difficult uh, or impossible for blacks to carry guns for protection. Um, and then, uh, so fast forward, you get to 1920. Uh, by 1960, you had had eight states uh, adopt right to carry laws. You had uh, uh, North and South Dakota. Uh, you had, um, uh, I'm drawing up Indiana. You had uh, some other states that had done that. Uh, and, then, and then you started having, uh, it was a gap of many years. Uh, a couple started doing it in the 80s. Florida, 
made a big splash in 1987 when they did it. Uh, and then you had a number of states in the mid to late 90s uh, adopt uh, concealed carry. Uh, the last state uh, to do so, the last two states were Wisconsin and Illinois, uh, Illinois in like 12, uh, 2013, and then you had Washington, D.C. You know, the interesting thing, and it's relevant for the Supreme Court case that's coming up, is that the states that were forced to adopt right to carry laws as a result of court decisions have kind of very grudgingly done it. They've adopted it, but they've made it very costly to do it. So Illinois, uh, when they were forced to do it as a result of uh, a circuit court decision in the seven, uh, not only did they have the costs that we were talking about before and the long training requirement, but they also did things like there's no training facilities in Chicago. Uh, you're not allowed to take a permitted concealed handgun even with you on, on, on public transportation. So if you're a poor person who lives in uh, Chicago uh, and you don't own a car, you have to figure out some way of borrowing somebody's car. And since it's 16 hours of training to be able to go and travel multiple days out maybe two to four days out well outside the city in order to get training and so you just don't see poor blacks getting permits uh dc which was also forced to do so as a result of uh court decisions uh also makes it extremely difficult and limits where you can carry so you only have a few tenths of one percent of the adult population in dc getting a permit uh, and john what is the, the Biden administration sees all this, they see state by state, 20 million Americans with a concealed carry permit, tens of millions more able to carry without needing a permit. And they've now decided to use the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives to tax gun ownership. Can you talk about that and how you see the legality of that or the constitutionality of that using BATF regulations? Right. So uh, what they want to do is classify certain guns as what are called class three weapons, which traditionally have been machine guns. They've been some items like silencers. It's pretty well spelled out in, uh, in the legislation that created a class three weapons, what constitutes a machine gun. Uh, but it's, you know, the problem that you face is that uh, this will go through the courts. Uh, the D.C. Circuit is what handles regulatory issues. And the Democrats have basically a two-to-one majority on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, so my guess is what's going to happen is you may be tied up for five or six years uh, with any types of rules that they have before you have a chance of maybe getting to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is hearing about 60 cases a year. Uh, there are like 90,000 that are heard by the circuit courts around the country. Uh, so, you know, you have to depend upon the Supreme Court getting involved and that's not always a sure thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're, yeah, my guess is they'll lose if it goes to the Supreme Court, but you may have a rule that could be in place for a while before, and causing all sorts of problems. And it's just not guns. Uh, just uh, a week or so ago, uh, the Biden administration put out proposed rules uh, for things like uh, uh, stabilizing braces for guns. Uh, I don't know if you know what this is, but it's basically a strap that attaches to a gun and wraps around a person's arm. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why they were developed uh, was for military veterans who had maybe lost part of their hand or were disabled in their arm. Their arm was crippled. Uh, to make it possible for them to be able to hold a gun, maybe for self-defense. Uh, uh, you know, we have so often, in the case of gun control, you have one instance that's then used to go and pass laws. So we had a, a, a shooting in Boulder, Colorado, where the person wore a stabilizing brace. Uh, it's, I've seen nothing that indicates that he was disabled in his arm in any way. Uh, he was firing at close range uh, within a grocery store. Uh, so the point of having a stabilizing brace is hardly obvious to me. Uh, and 
Yet, you know, what happens is they go and look, they say this one case, we should try to ban these things. Uh, what they're going to do is try to classify it as a class three weapon, which would require people who have these who are disabled are going to have to go through a long and cumbersome approval process, which can take nine months or a year right now. I assume if they overload the system with putting all these other weapons in it and things like stabilizing braces, uh, the approval process is going to be much, much, much longer. What's uh, the tax? What's the tax they're trying to put on a hunting rifle? Well, if they classify it as a class three weapon, it would be two hundred dollars. But I mean, that's only part of the problem, and the big problem is just the long time delays that you have and the paperwork uh, that you have to go through, and you have to get approval from like your local sheriff. Uh, it's really a burdensome process uh, for people to have to go through. And uh, it's not clear yet what they want to go and classify as a class three weapon. Uh, during the campaign last year, if you literally read what was on Biden's website, it sounded like they could include all semi-automatic rifles that were there. Uh, uh, you know, but, you know, who knows what they're going to try to do. But the problem is just Democrats control the D.C. circuit. And so you're going to have a very long, drawn-out process uh, where whatever they do is going to have be effective law. Could we go back to what, some of your early studies where when Florida became a concealed carry state, the, the drop in violent crime that followed a number of states except uh, implementing concealed carry. Give us some sense about how big a deal that is, because, of course, the left's position is more guns will give you more crime. Uh, in point of fact, what did you find as states adopted concealed carry? Now, maybe before we even get to the evidence on concealed carry, I'll just mention one simple fact that I think is particularly powerful with regard to the debate on whether guns on net are good or bad. If you look around the world, not just in the United States, but every place that's either banned all guns or all handguns, every single time murder rates go up. You would think out of randomness, if particularly if you think guns are bad, mm -hmm. uh, but out of randomness, you should get once or twice where murder rates or homicide rates would fall or at least stay the same. And yet they go up every single time. And and I think there's a simple thing that's occurring here. And that is when you ban guns, uh, it's the most law abiding good citizens who turn them in. And if you even if you take some guns away from the criminals, if you primarily disarm law abiding citizens relative to criminals, you make it easier for criminals to go and commit crimes. You know, we've tried this in Chicago and in Washington, D.C. There were huge increases in murder and violent crime rates after the bans went into effect. Gun control advocates will, will say, well, uh, you know, you shouldn't expect these things to work unless you ban guns every place because people can still get guns from the rest of Illinois or Indiana or Maryland or Virginia. The problem is it would have been nice if they'd kind of let us in on this when that they didn't expect it to work when they argued for the laws to be put in effect to begin with. But but England you, and uh, England, Australia, New Zealand did pretty much nationwide bans or, or reductions, correct? Uh, there are differences between the different countries. Uh, the UK uh, in January uh, 97 uh, banned handguns. Uh, and the eight years afterwards, there was about a 50% increase in homicide rates. Uh, the homicide rates and violent crime rates only came down after that when they had about an 18% increase over a few years in the number of police officers in the country uh, and to respond to the huge spike in violent crime. And even then, it only brought it back down to about where it was to begin with. In, New in Australia, uh, in 1996 and 97, they had a gun buyback where they bought back about uh, a quarter of the guns that had been legally owned by citizens in the country. After that, they didn't ban guns, but what they did was they instituted a licensing requirement that they had. The interesting thing is by 2010, uh, and possibly even before that, but uh, at least by 2010, the percentage of adults that own guns in Australia was actually higher than it was prior to the buyback that was there. 
And so you should imagine if they're right, what you should have observed is a big sudden drop in violent crime when the buyback occurred and then over time, a gradual increase as the percentage of the population with guns went back up and then above where it had been beforehand. In fact, you don't see that at all in terms of murder rates. It, they had been falling for about 15 years prior to the buyback. They basically are flat uh, afterwards. Uh, and things like armed robbery actually went up afterwards. But it's very hard to go and look at that and see any evidence um, that they produced any benefits. What usually happens when you read op-eds or other discussions with that is they compare uh, the average you know, suicide rate with guns or homicide rate with guns in the 15 years prior to the buyback with the period afterwards. The problem is, is that both homicides and suicides were falling prior to it. If, if suicides kept on falling afterwards, let me give you a simple example. Let's say, let's say they were falling in a perfectly straight line over 30 years. I could pick any point along that line and the after average is going to be below the before average. But if it's a perfectly straight line, you wouldn't say that the law had any impact on it. What you'd want to see is, did, did it fall at a faster rate or a slower rate afterwards? Was there some discontinuity in the line? And what you find is that actually they fell more slowly after the gun control rules went into effect than they did beforehand. If anything, it seems to have been counterproductive. But I'm sorry. John, no, no, just quick, uh, flipping from guns uh, to uh, voting rights. A number of states are requiring a voter ID and critics of that think that that's uh, awful. Um, could you give us a sense in Europe uh, where they are on voter ID, the requirement that you have an ID when you vote, and on vote by mail, which is the other issue uh, that that is contentious in some of the 50 states? Where are the Europeans on that? Right, or even the developed world generally. Uh, you know, you look at Europe, there are 47 countries in Europe. 46 of them currently require government-issued photo IDs. Some of them mandate that you have to have passports uh, in order to go and vote. Uh, the one exception has been parts of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland has required government-issued photo IDs and some local elections in England have required them. But right now, just in the last couple months, uh, Boris Johnson's government has put forward legislation that would require government-issued uh, voter IDs for all elections in the UK. So pretty soon, UK is going to join the rest of the continent and all 47 countries are going to be required. The interest vote by mail? Right. Well, and vote by mail is, is much more restrictive than what we have here in the United States. 75% uh, of European countries ban absentee ballots for people living in the country, just completely ban them. Another 20% require that you have to have government issued photo IDs to go and pick up the ballot. They don't send it by mail. You have to go and physically pick it up and show your ID when you pick it up. And some of those countries make it restrictive so that you either have to be in the military or in the hospital. And they just don't take your word for it. You have to go and have third party verification. That's gonna happen. So 95% of European countries are much more restrictive in terms of absentee ballots than any place in the United States. You know, just take Texas, for example, right now that uh, Biden has been calling racist. The big change that they want to have in Texas is that they want to require that somebody has to be with the uh, ballot boxes at all times uh, and that they will limit the hours to like 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. You know, the thing is, I can't find another country in the world that leaves ballot boxes unattended. All these other countries are concerned about things like chain of custody with the ballots. But having a ballot box unattended at 3 a.m. Uh, is something that the Democrats, you know, walked out of the votes on in, uh, in Texas. That was the main thing that they were upset about. Texas isn't changing its ID requirements. Texas has more liberal uh, uh, ID requirements than any country in Europe is going to be having once the UK changes. 
uh, they allow you to do things like put down the last four digits of your social security number. There's no country in Europe that allows you just to go and write down a number there in order to go do in-person voting. Uh, uh, John, could you give us contact information? How do, uh, what's the website people can go to look at more of your work? Sure, well, uh, the, it's crimeresearch.org, crimeresearch.org for the Crime Prevention Research Center. Excellent. John Lott, Grover Norquist here. Thank you very, very much. This is Leave Us Alone uh, with Grover Norquist. Uh, and uh, a reminder, the Leave Us Alone is both a video and an audio podcast. And if you like what you've seen here and heard, uh, be sure and like and follow us on Facebook and subscribe to Americans for Tax Reform on YouTube. Hitting the thumbs up button would also be appreciated. And your engagement with the show helps people learn more about it. If you're more into audio podcasts, you can leave us, you can see Leave Us Alone with Grover Norquist on Apple Podcasts, the Spotify and Stitcher or wherever else you get your uh, podcasts. Be sure to like and leave a review. Uh, everybody, see you in a week when we rejoin Leave Us Alone with Grover Norquist with another issue of Liberty. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Grover.